All right, students. This is Mrs. Foy, and this is part two of the Cellular Respiration AP Bio Lecture. I just want to say you can do this, right? This is this is crazy, crazy hard stuff. Um, but um, we're 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 almost there. We can definitely do this. All right. So. At this point, you have already watched the lecture for part one of cellular respiration, where I kind of gave an overview, and then we talked about the three acts of cellular respiration. So act one is glycolysis, act two is uh, the citric acid cycle. Um, the citric acid cycle is also called Krebs cycle, Krebs cycle, and we talked about how glycolysis is uh, in the cytoplasm of the cell. We talked about how um, glycolysis only produces two ATPs um, from one molecule of glucose. Um, and we talked about the citric acid cycle is in the matrix of the mitochondria. So it moves, the reactions move into the mitochondria in the matrix. And um, this also produces just a few ATPs um, per pyruvate molecule. And both of these produce ATP in a not very uh, productive way that's called substrate level phosphorylation, where the phosphate group is just attached to um, the ATP with um, some energy um, from the um, from the chemical reactions from food. So substrate level phosphorylation, we talked about that. And so today we are going to talk about Act 3. Act 3 is the grand finale, the electron transport system or the electro electron transport chain. And then we're also going to talk about what happens when you don't have any oxygen? What can you do then? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So the grand finale of cellular respiration is the electron transport chain. And I've made the background of these slides in green so that if you get lost when we're talking about all this biochemistry, you'll know that we're still talking about the electron transport chain. And this is going to be where the mother load of ATPs are created. Lots of ATPs are created here. And this is where we're finally going to use the electrons that we stripped off our glucose. Remember that we use these electron carriers, the NADH and the FADH2, that are carrying the electrons for us. We're finally going to use these. Um, and it's, it's going to make ATPs in a really cool way. So let's just set the stage of, of where we are in the mitochondria, okay? So we know the mitochondria is a double-membraned organelle, and the matrix is the stuff in the middle, and that's where Krebs cycle um, is. But the membrane, the inner membrane, is called the cristae. And this inner membrane of the mitochondria is where the electron transport chain is embedded. It is also where this amazing protein called ATP synthase or ATP synthetase is also embedded in the membrane. So when I talk about the inner membrane space, I'm talking about the space between the cristae so this is the cristae, and the outer membrane. So the inner membrane space is between the inner and the outer membrane. And there's something really important that happens there. All right, so keep that in mind. So here's a picture of what's going on here, right? So we have the matrix, and we know that a Krebs cycle is, uh, is occurring there. And interestingly... This is a good time to bring this up. The, the, um, the mitochondria has its own DNA. 
and it's called mitochondrial DNA, or sometimes it's called extra nuclear DNA. But keep in mind about this later, because um, in our mini medical school uh, case that we're going to be doing this year, we're going to be talking about uh, diseases that have to do with uh, mitochondria that don't work. And some of them have to do with mutations on the mitochondrial DNA. So, so keep that in mind. So here's our Christe in yellow in this picture. And you can see that we have these um, ATP synthase, right? These are these uh, proteins that are going to help, obviously, from the name ATP synthase. I can tell it's an enzyme that makes ATPs and it's embedded on the Christe, right? And then here is the inner membrane space that, um, that is also where some uh, interesting things are going to happen right here in the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So now we're, we're, we'll pulled up even further, and this is where the action is going to happen, okay? So on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, we're going to have a series of proteins that are embedded in the Christe. And those um, proteins are part of a system that we call the electron transport chain because it kind of forms a chain of passing electrons. And the electrons that are being carried on the NADH molecule, remember, originally came from the glucose. Some of them were stripped off of pyruvate, but these electrons came from there. And so this is what is going to happen to these electrons. The electrons are high energy. And so they're going to be passed kind of like an electron hot potato. So you know the game hot potato. It's where you pass a, a little imaginary hot potato really fast from one person to another person. This electron is going to be passed to different proteins in the electron transport chain. And as it does that, what is going to happen is this electron is going to lose some of its energy to pump hydrogen protons from the matrix out to the inner membrane space. So this is going to be what we call a proton pump. And it's going to pump a bunch of hydrogen protons into this inner membrane space. And you might say, well, why? why? What does that have to do with ATPs? Well, when you have a high concentration of a molecule, remember, that is going to give us the potential to do some work. And so what's going to happen is, is that this inner membrane space is going to then allow hydrogens to go through, back down their concentration gradient, through this really cool kind of a motor protein called ATP synthase. And that is going to make ATPs in a really different way, which you'll see in just a minute. And it's going to make a whole, whole bunch of ATPs. And that is basically what the electron transport chain does. So what happens is, is that in this gray area, so this is the outer membrane, this is the Christe, and so what happens is because of the electron transport chain that is going to be embedded on this Christe, hydrogens are going to be pumped. I'm going to get a, a gradient, a concentration gradient that is going to be built, a concentration gradient of hydrogen protons in the center membrane space. And don't forget that hydrogen the concentration of the hydrogen protons is how we measure pH. And so this is going to have a lot, a lot of hydrogen protons in it. And so I would expect the pH in this area to be very acidic, right? This would be a very acidic pH. 
But anyway, I have this concentration gradient here, and then the cell allows this uh, concentration gradient, which was built from the energy of these electrons, these hydrogen protons are going to flow back down through this ATP synthase um, enzyme, protein enzyme, and it's going to make some ATPs. So this process that we're talking about now is called oxidative phosphorylation. There's also something called chemiosmosis, and we've already talked about electron transport. So uh, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to explain oxidative phosphorylation, chemiosmosis, and the electron transport and how that is tied to ATP. So what we're starting with here is we're starting with the electrons that were stripped off the glucose and the pyruvate and were then um, carried right it they they reduce the NADH the NAD and the FAD to FADH2 and NADH those are reduced and these electron carriers the NADH and the FADH2 are going to carry those electrons to the electron transport chain and we're going to see what's going to happen with them so this is um, a really cool picture that shows in detail what the electron transport chain looks like. It's a multi-protein complex. That's a good way to describe it. And it actually is in four different groups or groups of clusters of proteins. So complex one has got a bunch of molecules in it. And some of these you might remember. A lot of the multi-protein complexes have to do with vitamins or vitamin derivatives. So have you ever heard of riboflavin? Riboflavin is actually derived from vitamin B2, and that's part of this complex number one, part of the electron transport chain. Complex number two is this guy right here. And one of the things that's interesting about him is that he has a, um, a protein that's embedded that's called um, ubiquinone. And ubiquinone is lipid soluble, must be pretty nonpolar, right? And so that's what's interesting about protein complex number two. Protein complex number three includes cytochromes. And these are, um, there are different types, there's cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, cytochrome C, cytochrome A, and A3. And these are molecules um, that are very ancient. They have been used to shuttle electrons for a long time. And um, we can actually look at those when we look at how uh, related living things are by looking how similar their cytochromes are. But there are some other um, iron sulfur molecules that act kind of like heme groups. So do you remember that there was a heme group in hemoglobin in red blood cells that carry oxygen? So what these guys do, they're kind of heme groups too, but instead of carrying oxygen, they're carrying electrons. And then complex number four com uh, contains some more cytochromes, and some copper. So I just, you don't have to memorize all these. I thought it was interesting about them being derived from some vitamins, because you always wonder, like, you know, what do vitamins do? But let's talk about what these guys are actually doing, okay? So I'm going to erase this so we can, I've all cluttered it up. I'm going to actually show you this now, okay? So what do we have here? Well, I've got my NADH and my FADH2. Remember, this guy carries a little lower energy, a little lower energy electron here. And this guy is, is carrying a little higher energy electrons. And these were stripped off the, um, our, our carbon, our fuels, right? Our glucose and our pyruvate. And so what happens is, is that the electrons get um, in here. And when they, when the electrons are, uh, added to these complexes, then the NADH is oxidized back to NAD. And so that NAD is going to go back and be reused again. That's really important, okay? 
Same thing's happening here. This electron is dumped off the electron carrier. It's going to reduce here, but the FAD is going to go back to the um, Krebs cycle and it's going to be used over again. So meanwhile, we're going to have this alternating oxidation reduction hot potato game where these electrons go from higher energy, they go from higher energy electrons down to lower energy down here. And this energy is going to be used in the step-by-step -step way. It's going to be used to pump hydrogen protons. And these hydrogen protons are going to do some work. But the electron, let's talk about what's going to happen to the electrons that get down by the time they get to the lowest energy, we have to do something with them. It's really dangerous to let electrons just like flying around the cell. It's not good. So my final electron acceptor is oxygen. And you remember oxygen is one of the um, reactants of cellular respiration that I told you to watch for. Well, what does oxygen do? Oxygen is very, very electronegative. It's going to pull these electrons down to, it's going to catch it like in a catcher's mitt. And so it is going to, it is going to reduce the oxygen and hydrogen protons are around. They're all over the place. They're going to be attracted because now it's negative. And my final product, guys, is water. Right? So remember that water is one of the products of cellular respiration. So these electron carriers that are embedded in the electron transport chain in the cristae are going to be alternatingly reduced and then oxidized as they first accept the electron and then pass on the electron they're going to be oxidized. And that in, the electron is going to be dropping in free energy as it goes down the chain. Oxygen is my final electron acceptor. My final electron acceptor. And then that forms water because hydrogen protons are going to add on to that. So this is kind of strange. Guys, think about this. Did you ever think about, well, I know we need oxygen, but why? Why do, why do we breathe in oxygen? Why do we need oxygen? This is the answer. We need oxygen because it's an electron dump. That's why we have to have it. Think about it. You're breathing in oxygen. Why? This is the reason. Oxygen is an electron dump. That's what it is. That's why we need it. But it's pretty important because we have to have somewhere to dump those electrons after we use the energy to pump some protons. So we talked about these cytochromes. They're going to be one of the carriers that play electron hot potato. And we talked about oxygen, how oxygen is going to accept those uh, electrons as they're jumping from higher energy down to lower energy. Now we're going to talk about how we're going to get some ATP. Because see this? This says the electron transport chain generates no ATP. Say what? Why are, what? What? Is that a mistake? Nope, it's not a mistake. Because it's going to do something else so that then ATP can be created. So here it is, guys. Here is the secret. We're going to put this all together. This is my electron transport chain, right? Let's just go through this again. So I've got these electrons that are being carried from my, um, from my carrier molecules. Uh, here's NADH and FADH2. It's going to pass the electrons. You can see that the, um, the yellow path is the path of electrons, right? So there, there's the cytochromes. They're going to be carried. Oops, here's oxygen. It's the final electron acceptor, and I make water. But what is happening to these electrons as we go from higher energy to lower energy by the time that it bonds to the oxygen? Well, here's what's happening. The energy from those electrons is used to pump hydrogen protons into the inner membrane space. This is the inner membrane space. The inner membrane space is going to have a super high concentration of these hydrogen protons.
it's going to create a concentration gradient of hydrogen protons. So then what? Here is the connection. What happens is, is that these hydrogen protons are going to be allowed to pass through this channel. They're going to go down their concentration gradient. After I used a whole lot of energy to pump them into this space, right? The energy came from these electrons. So now the hydrogen protons are going to go down their concentration gradient. And as they do that in this special molecule, ATP synthase, it actually kind of turns this almost like a turbine on this protein motor. And that takes ADP and phosphate and bonds them together to make ATPs. And that process is called chemiosmosis. So you know what osmosis is, right? Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Well, chemiosmosis is kind of the diffusion of, like you can think of it as a chemical. What's the chemical? It's a hydrogen proton moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. And that's called chemiosmosis. Together with the electron transport chain plus chemiosmosis, do you see how they're connected? That is oxidative phosphorylation. Why is it oxidative? Because we need oxygen to be the final electron dump. Why is it phosphorylation? Because I get the energy to do this endergonic reaction, right? This ADP plus phosphate makes ATP. I need energy from that. And that's the energy that I get from this hydrogen proton that's going down its concentration gradient. Woo! That's a lot, right? So this chemiosmosis is the driver, this, this driving of the hydrogen proton, we're going to do some cellular work. And that cellular work is going to be to make ATPs. So there is a video that is on your slideshow that you can click and look. It's only three minutes. Please watch it. It's so cool. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube and I'm not uh, your teacher, you can just uh, Google a video um, of ATP synthase. And it basically shows you, it looks like a little windmill thing. So here's my inner membrane space. Here's my hydrogen proton. This purple thing, guys, is a, is a protein complex. This is ATP synthase or synthetase, however you want to say it, right? Right here. And so what happens is these hydrogen protons come in. And I think it's like three hydrogen protons come in. They come in through this uh, stator protein, and this little rotor part of the protein moves over. And every time you get three of these, it turns a little crank, and that is enough energy on this catalytic knob that causes enough energy for this endergonic reaction to make ATP. It's crazy. It's like a little windmill that's being turned by hydrogen protons, and the work that's being done is to make ATPs. That is oxidative phosphorylation. So here's another cartoon of it. And you can see, here's my ADP, here's a phosphate, and I'm making some ATPs here. OK, so that's what that looks like. So please watch that video. It really helps. So the work that that hydrogen gradient produces from uh, being pumped from the energy of those electrons creates something called a proton motive force, right? Because I have a concentration gradient, guys. Every time I have a concentration gradient, I can do some work. And so this work, because it's a concentration gradient specifically of a hydrogen ion, hydrogen ion is a proton, right? And so that's why we call it a proton motive force. So here we've got the big picture, all right? Here is the citric acid cycle. Glycolysis, our stage one, our act one, has occurred already in the cytoplasm, right? So yeah, I got a few ATPs, not money, two, big whoop. And I make a couple ATPs from my Krebs cycle, big whoop. But what I make that I need a lot of is I'm going to make, I'm going to strip off some electrons in both of these, and I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to insert them here in my electron transport chain, which happens on the inner, the cristae, the cristae of the mitochondria. And so the electrons are going to be passed down these blue lines here, right? From higher energy to lower energy, an electron transport uh, hot potato game. When the electrons lose their energy down to their lowest uh, energy that we have, they kind of get all the energy out of them. They're going to bond to oxygen. Oxygen is the electron dump. It's going to react with some hydrogen protons, and it's going to make water. Meanwhile, there are some uh, protein carriers here that are going to use the energy from the high uh, energy electrons and pump hydrogen protons into this inner membrane space, creating a proton motive force. And then through the process of chemiosmosis, these hydrogen protons are going to be allowed to flow down through their concentration gradient through this really cool protein motor called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is going to turn, it's going to crank enough energy to be able to phosphorylate an ADP and a phosphate, and that makes ATPs. Whew! That's the electron transport chain. So we are almost done, guys. We are almost done. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about um, how much energy we get from ATPs. So they're uh, in one mole of ATPs. And um, if you're in my class, I'll show you what a mole looks like. I have some mole of sulfur I can show you. But one mole of ATPs is going to equal about seven calories, kilocalories, but capital C calories. And you're like, well, that doesn't seem like very much. Um, but we go through in one day, an average human uses their body weight of ATPs every day. That's crazy. That is a lot of ATPs. But what happens is, is that when we use the ATPs, right, and we use those to do some cellular work, they, we break it down into ADP and a phosphate, and then we basically recycle the pieces through the energy of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and finally um, the uh, electron transport chain, and we make more ATPs. So even though we use our body weight worth of ATPs, we're just recycling it constantly. So we're going to go through a, a couple more slides here, and then we're, we're going to go. So during this cellular respiration, most of the energy flows in this sequence, right? So we have, we have the uh, chemical energy in the bonds of glucose. Those electrons are stripped off into NADH. Those go to the electron transport chain. Those then, uh, that energy is used to pump hydrogen protons to make a concentration gradient in the inner membrane space to create a proton motive force. And through the process of chemiosmosis, those hydrogen protons are going to go down their concentration gradient and make some ATP. About 40% of the energy in a glucose molecule is transferred to ATP during cellular respiration. And the total is about 38 ATPs. So we got two ATPs from glycolysis. We got two ATPs from Krebs cycle. So that's about 34 ATPs. Um, and when I say about, it depends a little bit about how high energy the electrons are but about 34 ATPs in the electron transport chain. That's a lot of ATPs. And, um, but you think, well, that's not very efficient. Only 40% of the energy. What happens to the other 60%? Well, it's basically lost in the transfer. But think about this. I love this quote. The cellular engine of burning us uh, glucose, right? Burning it with, uh, you know, with through oxidation is 40% efficient, which is m double uh, uh, the efficiency of a gas burning engine, right? So our car engines are only about 20% efficient. So our little cells do a pretty good job. 
So here's the whole picture, guys, the whole kit and caboodle, right? And um, and this is, is uh, just shows you the whole picture. So hopefully this is something that you can study and go back over your notes and be able to understand. So what I want to talk about now for the rest of the lecture is I want to talk about what happens when you have no oxygen, right? What are your choices? Well, you can go through glycolysis, right? You get your two pyruvic acids, but then there is going to be this fork in the road. Because if oxygen is present, if you have oxygen present, and if your, your cell is the type of cell that can... Uh, can uh, handle what we call aerobic, right? This is aerobic respiration. Then you're going to go to Krebs cycle and you're going to go to the electron transport chain. But if you don't have oxygen present, then you basically have two options. Some bacteria, and including our muscle cells, can do a chemical reaction called lactic acid fermentation. If your yeast cells and some other types of, of bacteria, you go through something called alcoholic fermentation. And so those are the options if you don't have oxygen. So technically, there is a difference between fermentation and anaerobic respiration. Okay, but both of these are ways to produce ATPs without oxygen when you don't have any oxygen. So most cellular respiration requires oxygen to produce ATP, and we saw that oxidative phosphorylation is indeed a very, uh, very productive way to produce ATPs. Um, glycolysis, of course, is the first step with or without oxygen. So you're always going to do glycolysis first, but if you don't have oxygen, then you have to go through fermentation to be able to uh, produce TPs. So fermentation is a partial breakdown of glucose that recurs without oxygen. Aerobic respiration is a more efficient way, as we saw, of burning glucose all the way down to carbon dioxide, right? So it breaks it all the way down from C6H12O6. It breaks it all the way down to CO2. And I, um, uh, I have to use oxygen for that to happen. And we just explained that. Anaerobic respiration is technically similar to aerobic respiration, but um, it uses compounds other than oxygen. So there really is a difference between fermentation and anaerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration uses an electron transport chain with an electron acceptor other than oxygen. And guys, these are not going to be any kind of animal cells that do these. These are going to be mostly some bacteria that do this. But fermentation is going to be a branch of uh, cellular respiration that comes after glycolysis, but it occurs when there's no oxygen, and so there would be no electron transport chain. So here's an example of some weird bacteria. These sulfate-reducing bacteria actually uses sulfur to be the final electron acceptor instead of oxygen. So I'm not going to get all hung up on that. Um, if you take microbiology, you'll learn more about that. But let's do talk about fermentation because there's two different types of fermentation. There is alcoholic fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. But what they have in common, I'm going to show you right now. They do not make any more ATPs than what you would with just glycolysis. Notice both of them start with glycolysis. And remember, it's going to net two ATPs. But look what happens. The only thing that happens is that I am going to take my NADH, and I can't use it, right? Because there's going to be no electron transport chain because I have no oxygen. And there's not going to be, there's going to be no Krebs cycle because I don't have oxygen, okay? So I don't need these, right? And But I got, I have to have a way to, 
regenerate the NAD because otherwise glycolysis stops. So what happens is, is that their electron is going to go on to another molecule. The point is not that you can make ethanol. The point is that you regenerate the NAD so you can make more glycolysis, okay? So you can make some more ATPs. Let's look at lactic acid fermentation. Same thing. I go through glycolysis. I've got pyruvate. But I can't just stop here because then I would, I would run out of NAD. Do you guys see that? I would run out of NAD and I have to have a way of regenerating that. So the purpose of lactic acid fermentation is just another way to regenerate the NAD. So the electrons are going to come off my NAD, so it's going to be oxidized back to NAD from NADH, and then the pyruvate is going to be reduced to lactate. So alcoholic fermentation, we're going to talk about first, and obviously we use alcoholic fermentation in wine making and alcohol making and also in baking. And here is why. Let's count carbons. Here's my six carbon uh, glucose. I'm going to go through glycolysis. I make two ATPs. I make two pyruvates, right? But look what happens. In alcoholic fermentation, carbon dioxide is cut off. Right, so look, one, two, three carbons is made into a two carbon molecule called acetaldehyde. And there are two of them because of course there's two pyruvate, so I make two CO2. So I make carbon dioxide. So this is like when you bake bread with yeast, right? The, the, the bread rises um, and that's because this carbon dioxide is being made. Right? If, you, if you make beer or something like that, you're going to see bubbles, um, and that's because carbon dioxide is being made. So what is the action step, though, is what I just talked about earlier. Notice I still have one, two carbons. Nothing else is being made here. No more ATPs are being made. I'm not chopping off any more carbons. But what is happening is my NADH has got to be oxidized back to NAD so I can do glycolysis again. And these electrons that are coming from the NADH are going to reduce acetaldehyde to ethanol. And that is the whole purpose of alcoholic fermentation. It is not to make humans alcohol. It is to regenerate NAD so that we can go through glycolysis without oxygen, right? The whole purpose of this type of fermentation is no oxygen. Do humans do alcoholic fermentation? No. We do another type of fermentation called lactic acid fermentation that does not release CO2. All right, and lactic acid fermentation is done by our muscle cells, um, and it's also done by some fungi and some bacteria that we use to make cheese and yogurt. So lactic acid fermentation looks very similar. It starts with glycolysis, right? Starts with glucose. Two ATPs are made, and then I end up with two pyruvates, right? I'm sorry. One glucose molecule, two ATPs make two pyruvate. Look what's going to happen. I'm going to make this three carbon molecule called lactate, or sometimes called lact this lactate. You might you might recognize this as ah, oh, that's a carboxylic acid group right here, right? But it's ionized, and so it's called lactic acid. But this is the ionized version, and so that's why we call it lactate. All right. But anyway, here I've got my NADH. I need to regenerate my NAD, right? So I need to oxidize. This is my oxidation. And then this is my reduction step. So the electrons are going to come off of here, go on to, um, it's the, the pyruvate's going to be reduced into lactate. And then I get my NAD regenerated so I can go through glycolysis again. So, is fermentation very productive? Uh, no, because it only produces two ATPs. Look, cellular respiration with aerobic, with aerobic cellular respiration with oxygen produces 38 ATPs. Poor little fermentation only produces two. So, why would we ever do it? What is the big deal?
Well, obviously, it's nice to be able to have some way to make some ATPs if you don't have oxygen. So some organisms are called obligate anaerobes. So these are cells, these are usually bacteria, that carry out fermentation and they can't even live in the presence of oxygen. So they are obligated to do anaerobic. They only do that. Our brain cells are an example of obligate aerobes, guys. This is why if we are deprived with oxy without oxygen for a matter of minutes, because our brain cells need oxygen as an electron dump, remember, that's what oxygen is. It's just an electron dump. Because of that, if we don't have oxygen, then what is going to happen is our brain cells are going to die. Our brain cells will die without oxygen within minutes. Okay, and so that's an example of an obligate aerobe, but there's lots of other uh, single-celled organisms that do that too. Yeast and other bacteria are facultative anaerobes, which means that if there's oxygen present, they can do cellular respiration. If there's no oxygen present, they can do either lactic acid or uh, alcoholic fermentation. But pyruvate is the fork in the road. So Always start with, with glucose, with glycolysis, but then here's the thing, pyruvate. Is oxygen present? And if you are a type of cell that's built for this, then you go straight into the link reaction, you go straight into the citric acid cycle, and then you would go straight to the ETC. If you get to pyruvate and there is no oxygen present, you have no choice but to complete the... Um, the chemical reaction by either at, uh, ethanol, alcoholic fermentation, or lactic acid fermentation, right? Because we have to regenerate the NAD to go back and do more glycolysis. So let's talk a little bit about the evolutionary significance of glycolysis. Uh, we think glycolysis is the oldest um, cellular uh, respiration uh, chemical reaction because it's in nearly all organisms and it hasn't really changed that much. So we think because of that, um, glycolysis was probably evolved in the ancient oceans um, in ancient bacteria before there was even oxygen in the atmosphere. So Catabolic pathways, right? Catabolism means taking big molecules and breaking them down. And so remember that we do this in order to create fuels that we can use for cellular respiration, right? That's why we do catabolic reactions. So we don't just use glucose, right? We can break down proteins into amino acids and we can use those to burn as fuels. And we can break down fats, right? So remember, fats are glycerol plus a fatty acid. And they can be broken down by something called beta oxidation and they yield a lot of acetyl-CoA. An oxidized gram of fat produces more than twice twice as many ATPs as an oxidized gram of carbohydrates or proteins, right? So we know this, right? Which has more calories? Fat has more than double the calories or energy of carbohydrate. So you do not have to memorize beta oxidation, okay? I just want to show you that if you take a 16 carbon fatty acid chain and you break it down by this process called beta oxidation, you get eight acetyl CoA's, right? And you remember the acetyl CoA's are going to go into Krebs cycle, and I can get a lot of energy from that, right? So, this is one of the reasons why fats give you so much more bang for your buck than carbohydrates or protein. So, this slide just kind of shows you all the different catabolic reactions and how they fit into cellular respiration. So carbohydrates, we know we are sugars and starches, and they can go right into glycolysis, right? We know that. 
proteins, when we break them down, we get to amino acids. And amino acids can be converted to pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, or they can go into the molecules that we need to use in the citric acid cycle. But one of the um, waste products that happen when we break down protein is we make ammonia, all right? And ammonia is a, a waste product that needs to be taken care of by our kidneys, and we excrete that as urine. So we'll talk about that later when we talk about um, physiology. Fats, remember, are made by one glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. Well, glycerol can, can be converted right in glycolysis to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And fatty acids, we just saw, can be broken down by beta oxidation to make a whole bunch of acetyl-CoAs, which are going to go into the citric acid cycle, which go to the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So it would seem to be important that we should have some kind of feedback, right, for cellular respiration. If ATP concentrations begin to drop, then we should say, uh, hello, I need some more ATPs. If there's plenty of ATPs, then we should be able to say, uh, slow it down, James, we don't need so much cellular respiration right now. And so I'm going to talk about just one of the ways that we can do that. So do you remember me showing you all the different stages of glycolysis? And I said, each one of these has its own particular enzyme. And I said, you do not have to memorize these. But I said, there's one that I want you to, to remember. Do you remember that? You probably circled it or put a star by it in your notes. And that enzyme is phosphofructokinase. It's just an enzyme that is involved in glycolysis. But here is where I want you to um see how cool this is, okay? If you have a lot of AMP, well, what the heck is AMP? So AMP is adenosine monophosphate. If you have a lot of this lying around, it's because you have a lot of broken down ATPs because ATPs break down into ADPs and ADPs can be broken down into AMPs. So if you have a lot of this, you it means you have used up a lot of your ATPs. So it makes sense, right? If you have a high level of AMP, it's going to stimulate phosphofructokinase to make glycolysis go faster, okay? If you have a lot of citrate, well, if I have a lot of citrate, that means I'm cranking my citric acid cycle, which means I probably have plenty of ATPs, right? And so a high level of citrate is going to inhibit phosphofructokinase, and of course, intuitively, if you have a lot of ATPs, duh. If you have a lot of ATPs, it's going to inhibit phosphofructokinase, sorry, which means slow down cellular respiration. If you stimulate phosphofructokinase, you're going to speed up cellular respiration. So this is an example of how one enzyme can be involved in a negative feedback control of cellular respiration. Negative feedback means that it's going to have an effect of the opposite of the stimulus to maintain homeostasis. One more quick thing. I want to talk just a little bit about muscles, okay? Because you're going to learn um, when you go to medical school or nursing school or um, you're going to take uh, graduate courses in biochemistry that there is another way that muscles can make ATPs quickly without oxygen because sometimes you're working so hard with your muscles. Now, remember, our brain cells cannot live without oxygen, but our muscle cells can. And there is another path to make um, some, some ATPs or some, some energy molecules um, by direct phosphorylation, all right? And we use this, uh, this chemical called creatin, uh, creatine phosphate, and that makes creatinine. And this process can produce 36 calories worth of ATPs in a minute. I mean, it's 36 calories per minute, but it only lasts about 10 seconds. So it's just, it's just for that last little, ugh, you're trying to get away from the saber-toothed tiger kind of thing, right? Just very short. Glycolysis produces 16 calories a minute. 
that can last up to about 45 seconds. So if you're doing fermentation without oxygen, remember our muscle cells do lactic acid fermentation, but it can only do it for about 45 seconds because what happens is, is that lactic acid is an acid. And so if that builds up, our pH starts to drop and that affects the, um, our, the, the chemistry of our muscle cells. And you know, the burn that you talk about, when you feel the burn in your muscles, it's this buildup of lactic acid. So after a while, um, even though athletes are trained to work through the burn, after a while, there's a limit to how much lactic acid you can tolerate and your muscles will shut down. And then, of course, we know about oxidative phosphorylation. That can only produce 10 calories a minute, but it can last a long time. So that's the end. The rest of the slides are just a review for you. Um, and I hope this has been helpful. I'll see you in class. And that is chapter nine.